Yo, what up, Wisecrack? Chris here to talk about the brains behind some of the most beautiful images in modern cinematic history. That's right, director Hayao Miyazaki and his animation house, Studio Ghibli. Now, any film nerd worth their artisanal salt can tell you that these films are masterful, offering feast after feast for the senses, but always with a generous, occasionally too generous, dose of heart that leaves this grown man ever so occasionally in tears. But recently, the studio debuted its first 3D animated film, Earwig and the Witch, directed by Miyazaki's son, Goro Miyazaki, to a cacophony of crickets. And while we've long been plagued by the stupendous failings of overly realistic three-dimensional animation, we feel like something different is going on here. Specifically, we think that Earwig's shortcomings reveal something important about what makes Miyazaki's other films so great. And it has everything to do with flatness. We'll explain in this Wisecrack edition on Studio Ghibli why 3D animation is overrated. And as always, spoilers ahead. And before we get into it, we have a big announcement. So Michael, the floor is yours. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure, Chris. You're crazy, man. Um, but the real reason I'm here is to let everyone know that Wisecrack's Rick and Morty podcast, The Squanch, is coming back. Season 5 of Rick and Morty starts on June 20th, and we're going to be staying up late to break down new episodes right after they air. It's hosted by Show Me the Meanings' Ryan Haley, along with myself, and a new guest each week. It's the perfect way to unpack the show and explore all the deep and weird themes in each episode. And to get everyone ready for Season 5, we'll be doing a special season preview episode with our friend Tommy Cook. Wait, what was that, Chris? Thank you. I too think that this season of The Squanch might be the best Rick and Morty podcast ever produced. So be sure to subscribe to The Squanch on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. And subscribe to our Wisecast YouTube channel where you'll be able to watch video versions of the podcast and catch a live stream of The Squanch following the season premiere on June 20th. And now, back to the... Oh, sorry. No problem, Michael. And, and now, now, back to, back the, to show. the show. Now, not to break your poor, precarious little hearts, but let's start by watching this poignant moment from Studio Ghibli classic, Ponyo. Obviously, there's the heartbreak of watching a fish girl turn human girl revert back into fish girl form, but there's something else that makes this scene so damn compelling. Strangely enough, it's the scene's flatness. Like watch again as the boy runs with his favorite fish girl. See how there's literally no sense of depth? This flatness isn't just some accidental visual choice. It's part of what makes Miyazaki film so, well, Miyazaki. To understand why, we need to examine Miyazaki's animation within the broader context of Japanese visual art. The most obvious comparison that comes to mind is the ukiyo-e, a genre of Japanese woodblock paintings which peaked in popularity during the Edo era between the 17th and 19th centuries. It's known for its depictions of middle-class urban life in Japan, like these fun folks apparently having a violent dance party, or these folks coveting their neighbor's garden. See, at the time, the middle class was flourishing, but strict class measures prevented members from using their newfound moolah to gain political power. Instead, they, much like a college freshman with a brand new credit card, spent their cultural capital going to the theater or hanging out in the bathhouse. These ukiyo-e images reflected this new reality by combining depictions of decadent urban life with traditional Japanese art stylings. As a result, the images tended to explore tensions between the sublime innocence of nature and the moral disarray of modern life. It's kind of like the menacing nature of this tunnel, as compared with the tranquil simplicity of the clouds lurking beyond it. This dichotomy between modern city life and tradition is everywhere in Ghibli films, like when they explore the tensions between a forest lover like Princess Mononoke and a militant deforestation advocate like Lady Eboshi. And the visual language that they use to do this is flatness. See. European art since the Renaissance has generally shown a major preoccupation with creating the illusion of depth, with obvious exceptions in movements like Impressionism and pop art. But Japanese art has long reveled in the possibilities presented by just two dimensions, and not just in Miyazaki animation films. Now what's interesting about flatness, and Miyazaki's use of it, is how it stands against the prevailing ideology of modern animation. According to scholar Thomas Lamar, animation has, since the early days of Disney, struggled with cinematism, that is, the successful display of motion via depth. It's cinematism that allows you to feel yourself actually traveling into the screen. That's what Lamar calls the ballistic angle, because of the forceful way it brings you into the image. And cinematism was the great struggle of early animators, none more so than our favorite OG Mouseketeer. To this end, Disney invented the multiplane camera. This allowed him to adjust the dimensions of every individual layer of animation in order to give the illusion of motion via the depth of the image. The logical conclusion of this work has been the hyper three-dimensionality of Pixar's animated films. 
This, to many, sums up the wonders of modern animation. But Miyazaki has always been different. He doesn't use a multi-plane camera or employ a style that emphasizes the ballistic angle of moving into the screen. Rather, he favors what Lamar describes as lateral movement in ways that undercut the sensations of depth, like this lateral moving car ride. That's in part because Miyazaki worries that the ballistic angle can even be potentially dangerous for kids by destroying their imaginations and relations to nature through its overly prescriptive visual cues. He avoids this by creating a super planar image, which, as Lamar explains, tends to produce motion on the surface as the different layers of the image vie for attention, transforming the image into an informatic space. You can see that in this moment of Spirited Away, where the library books, rather than existing on a different plane, seem to be directly colliding with Witch Lady's head. Here, rather than simply sweeping us into an image that reflects proportions of the real world, which can be readily understood, Miyazaki does something very different. Specifically, he compresses the various layers of the image altogether, creating a visually consuming sense of complex super flatness. This makes it difficult to decide where to feast your eyes, particularly when there's a literal feast involved. By creating a flat image, Miyazaki doesn't privilege any one part of the frame. Frequently, his backgrounds undulate, creating strobing effects that produce patterns, further overwhelming the eye, as in this delightful moment of Ponyo. The effect can be dizzying, impressionistic, and more overwhelming to the eye, and thus, more emotional. Remember that moment when we see Sosuke running against the blurred background of the tunnel? We also see this during the typhoon sequence in Ponyo, which is reminiscent of traditional Japanese paintings like these. The focus in this sequence is far less on the realism of how waves or branches crash and move, but rather the emotions that the dizzying movement can evoke. Which brings us to Earwig, Ghibli's first foray into the world of 3D animation, an art form that's been lighting up screens since these immortal words. To infinity and beyond! Obviously, moving into 3D necessarily represented a pretty big leap. After all, this is a studio whose currency has long been beautifully rendered, hand-drawn animation that leans into the flatness of Japanese visual culture. But that's not necessarily why it didn't work, at least in our opinion. Rather, in converting Ghibli's style into three dimensions, the aesthetic ironically lost its sense of complexity. Perhaps it's no wonder that the most visually interesting part of the film happens to be the seemingly hand-illustrated title card. The comparative realism required of 3D animation necessitates losing so much of what makes Ghibli's films so good in the first place. Here, the impressionistic sense of danger when unrealistic waves crash across the screen is replaced by a strangely boring sense of true gravitational force. Nowhere is this more clear than in the visual representations of food. There's a reason Studio Ghibli's on-screen dishes have inspired their fair share of YouTube cooking videos. Their meals are iconically rendered. Here, Ghibli follows in a long tradition of using flatness to accentuate the magic of morsels hitting our taste buds. Take artist Paul Cezanne's or Vincent Van Gogh's paintings, both called apples, and both of which show your teacher's favorite snack depicted on flattened planes. These paintings are similar to Ghibli's food scenes in that the food appears more appealing than it might in real life. They're more like symbols of apples than a real representation of the fruit. That's kind of like how the simmering bowl of ramen in Ponyo feels more like a symbolic representation of that most wholesome, stomach-warming dish. Now compare that to Earwig's depressingly realistic depiction of lemon-garnished fish and chips that makes me pretty sure I never want to eat again. Ultimately, Miyazaki's hand-drawn films use the flattening of space to evoke subjective emotions, rather than peddling in any sense of objective reality. Judging from the results of Earwig, when you lose that, you lose what makes the studio's 2D film so special. What do you guys think? Was Earwig the first major misstep for Studio Ghibli? Did losing its roots in the Japanese visual culture of flatness ruin what made it so great? Let us know in the comments. Huge thanks to all our patrons for all your support. Hit that subscribe button with the full power of your three-dimensional being, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This makes cool. cool. Got it. I was just moving back and listening to your voice in my head backwards while finding it. I found it. I'm ready to rock.